In the last lecture, we started looking at TBD methods, and I introduced the MinMod method. Uh, in this lecture, I will kind of reformulate that slope limiter method as a flux limiter method and see how we can extend it to handle a, a wider variety of limiter functions, some of which are, are better than MinMod in terms of achieving our goals. So um, just recalling from the last lecture, the main goal here is to get methods that have good accuracy on smooth solutions, by which I mean close to second order accuracy at best, typically, um, and, but that don't have any oscillations around discontinuities and that also capture the discontinuities as sharply as possible. And then to extend them to systems of equations, we'd like to look at it in the form of a uh, extension of Godunov's method based on solving Riemann problems, which I'll briefly mention today as well. So if you remember uh, this example, if we have some cell averages denoted by the dots here, and then we do a reconstruction with slopes in each cell chosen with this min-mod function, so we look at the slope uh, based on uh, one-sided slopes on either side and take the one that's smaller, in this case, in this this cell here, we would be taking a slope that is based on the slope looking to the right, um, which is smaller than the slope looking to the left. Uh, in all the other cells, when we look one direction or the other, we get zero slope. And so we'd have this reconstruction with the min-mod slope limiter. And then if we evolve that equation or that initial data with the advection equation for one time step and average it back onto the grid, we'll have a method that preserves monotonicity and that you can show fairly easily is total variation diminishing for arbitrary data. Um, but if we look at this, it looks like in this plot, we could probably uh, make a larger slope here. We could probably even double this slope, for example, to the point where this is hitting the lower limit here. Um, and we would still have a, a TBD method that would give us a monotone preserving method. And so near discontinuity, the min-mod slope is sometimes a little too restrictive. On the other hand, if we just look at the, the one-sided slopes and allow doubling one of those, taking sort of twice the min-mod function, then that might give us much sharper resolution of discontinuities, but it wouldn't work so well where things are smooth, because where things are smooth, the one-sided slopes are both reasonable approximations of, of the slope that we should be using. And if you double it, then it's no longer going to be second-order accurate. So the idea of this monotonized centered or MC limiter is that we look at double the, the min mod as being sort of an upper limit, but we also look at the centered slope. So in this cell, for example, we would look at the slope obtained by looking at the two neighbors, one to the left and one to the right. And where things are smooth, that's probably a reasonable value to use and similar to either of the one-sided slopes. Um, but we uh, take a look at that, and then we use as a limiter twice the min-mod to make sure that it, we don't get oscillations introduced uh, around the discontinuity if we can. So if we start with this uh, kind of slope, then again, at least for this example data, we would have a method that seems to preserve monotonicity. So here's the formula for that. Um, the MC limiter, we look at the centered slope which is Fromm's method if we just use that everywhere. But we apply a limiter to it that's based on twice the one-sided slope to the left and twice the one-sided slope to the right. So we look at all three of these quantities and we take the min-mod of those, meaning if they all have the same sign, we take the one that's smallest in, mag in magnitude. If, they, if there's any difference in sign between them, then we have to set the slope to zero because we're near a maximum or minimum. So again, the rationale is that where things are smooth, the centered slope should be a good approximation and give us second order accuracy. But near a discontinuity, we want to um, limit it, but no more than absolutely necessary. So I talked about this general approach to proving a method is TVD before, um, where we uh, think of taking our cell averages and reconstruct a piecewise linear function um, and if we do the reconstruction in a way that's total variation diminishing, uh, then 
the second and third steps, at least for a scalar equation, are also total variation diminishing, and so the whole algorithm is TBD. And you can use exactly this proof to show that the min mod limiter gives a TBD method. Unfortunately, when we look at this MC method, uh, it doesn't really fit into this framework directly because the reconstruction isn't necessarily TVD. The example I showed a minute ago, it was, but let's change the data just a little bit. Here's some data where, again, these are cell averages, and the cell averages are uh, strictly non-increasing, so the total variation of the, of the, the capital Q grid data is just the difference between the left state and the right state in absolute value. Um, that's the total variation. But the reconstruction has this little um, sawtooth in it that means that the reconstructed function is going to have a total variation that's the difference between the left and the right states plus the jump across that little sawtooth wave. So the total variation of this reconstruction is greater than the total variation of the original data. And so we can't prove that the MC method is TVD in general by following the same proof that works for, for the MinMod method. Um, however, just because this reconstruction is not TVD doesn't necessarily mean the method is not TVD. If you take this reconstructed um, function and advect it part of a grid cell and then average it onto the, the grid again, then if you look at where the cell averages lie in this um, evolved function, uh, well, there might be a cell average around here, maybe one around here, one around here, and then these are unchanged from the initial data, that's still monotone. And so the total variation of the solution uh, is no greater than the total variation of the original data was. It's just the sum of these jumps, which is again the difference between the left state and the right state. So the total variation hasn't increased even though uh, in our sort of intermediate reconstruction we seem to be increasing the total variation. And in fact the MC uh, method can be used and is total variation diminishing, you just can't prove it is by looking at it in terms of this reconstruct, evolve, and average approach. So we'll have to do something that's a little more algebraic. Uh, and so to do that, uh, we'll first rewrite the slope limiter method as a flux limiter method. So the way I introduced it so far is that we reconstruct this um, piecewise linear function q tilde, which has a slope that's associated with the ith cell, and we take the cell average and then put in a linear uh, correction to that, centered about the cell center, and that gives us the REA algorithm. And if you work out sort of what happens when you take that piecewise linear function and evolve it, then you come up with this formula for the new cell average, and it depends on the cell average in this cell. It also depends on the cell average in the cell on the upwind side. Oh, and here I'm assuming that u is positive. So the cell on the upwind side is cell i minus 1. Also in the sort of upwind correction here, we're looking to the left. Um, so this there would be a slightly different formula looking to the right if we had u negative. But rather than thinking about it in terms of, of slopes in cells, uh, let's instead look at it in terms of fluxes at the interface between cells. And we'll see not only does it make it possible to prove that the MC method, for example, is TVD to do that, but also the looking at it in terms of cell interfaces rather than cell averages uh, allows an easier extension to systems of equations. So in the flux, flux limiter framework, We'll go back to this form of, of flux differencing where we update the cell average. The new cell average is the old cell average um, minus delta t over delta x times the flux at the right boundary minus the flux at the left boundary, where these fluxes are some approximation of the time integral of the flux through the boundary. And if you just take this method up here and figure out how to rewrite it in this form, then what you'll find is that you have to take fi minus a half to be this expression. And then when you difference that between cells or interface i plus one, a half, and i minus a half, plugging it into this formula, you'll end up with the original method. Or another way to look at it is that um, this numerical flux is in fact the integral or the average over time delta t of this integral in time of 
the flux at the left edge using the true flux function, f of u is just u times q, but with this um, initial data, this q tilde n that we reconstructed um, from the cell averages by introducing these slopes. And if you take that and assume it's advecting to the right with speed u and look at what value you get right at the interface as a function of t and you integrate that in time, then you will again get exactly this formula, which agrees with, with the other way of looking at taking the cell average in space as they should since the sort of evolution and reconstruction step are, are being applied to a conservation law. So we can view the, the methods we've already looked at as being uh, in this sort of flux differencing form. So where do the limiters come in in this form? Um, oh, so first of all, that was for u positive. If we do something similar for u negative, we just get a slightly different expression because we're looking again to the right instead of to the left at what's flowing into or across the interface. And so at the cell interface between cells i minus one and i, we're either taking the solution that's in the left cell i minus one that's crossing the interface or the solution that starts out in cell i that's crossing it. And so when i is negative, it involves qi and it involves sigma i, the slope in that cell. So it seems a little messy that we have these two different formulas. Actually, it turns out we can uh, usually combine them into something simpler. Um, and that's easiest to explain if we go back to the Lax-Wendroff method to start with. And it turns out the Lax-Wendroff method, um, you can combine these two formulas nicely into this single formula um, because the slope that we're using is coming from the upwind side of the interface, depending on the value of u that we're using. But remember in Lax-Wendroff, we always choose the slope in each cell by looking in the downwind direction. So we're using the slope from the upwind cell, but it's computed in the downwind direction. So regardless of which direction is upwind and downwind, at the interface i minus a half, that sigma always turns out to be just the jump between qi and q minus 1, qi minus 1. Uh, well, it's actually that jump divided by delta x since the sigmas are slopes, but the divided by delta x I've moved into um, this expression. So I divided the factor here out in front by delta x, and then the sigma i minus 1 or sigma i just becomes the jump in q across the interface that we're looking at. So in terms of the flux at an interface, it's just the cells on either side of the interface that come into the Lax-Windroff Lax formula. Oh, also, of course, the, uh, the upwind part, the u times q on the upwind side, I've replaced here by the positive part of u times q in the cell on the left plus the negative part of u times q on the cell to the right. Also notice that there's different signs here in, in this term and these terms, and so that becomes absolute value of u here. But with those changes, <coughs> this formula now works for u of either sign. So this is the same thing, but I've just replaced this jump in Q, QI minus QI minus one. I'm gonna call that delta QI minus a half. It's the jump in Q across the interface I minus a half that we're looking at. Um, and now the idea of a flux limiter method is that we're gonna replace this uh, delta QI minus a half to jump across the interface, replace that with some limited version that I'll call little delta I minus a half N. So this formula the flux limiter method uses this flux where we have this limited version of the jump in Q in place of the full jump in Q. So this is sort of how we can turn a slope limiter method into a flux limiter method. So whatever limiter we were thinking of applying to the, to the slopes to get the sigmas, we can try to do something similar, but just apply it to each jump across the interface to get the corresponding um, little delta. So as I mentioned, this also is advantageous when we go to extending these methods to systems of equations. If we're looking at a linear system, then one way to kind of generalize would be to diagonalize the system to a set of uh, scalar advection equations and apply whatever limiter method we want to each of the advection equations and then recombine. Um, 
but we can also look at it in terms of sort of an extension of the wave propagation version of Godunov's method, where we start out by taking our delta q i minus a half that we want to apply limiters to for this correction term up here. Um, that's now a vector. And in Godunov's method, we start out by taking that vector and splitting it up as a linear combination of the eigenvectors of the matrix A. So the alphas here are scalars, but the R, P are, are the eigenvectors. And those combinations, alpha times R, are what we call these, these waves, script W. Um, and then in addition to using those waves for Godunov's method, which is basically the first order update, we can also apply limiters to the waves and get some limited version of each wave. And at least for the linear system, since the eigenvectors never change, if it's a constant coefficient linear system, we can think of doing that by applying limiters to the, the scalar alpha values. And then we can take the limited version of those and use those in second order correction terms that are very similar to this term up here, except that now we'll be summing over all the waves and instead of the absolute value of u, we'll have the absolute value of the wave speed for that wave. And instead of the little delta up here, we'll have the corresponding limited wave. So later we'll look in more details at that um, approach for systems. But the idea is that we can extend these methods in a very natural way, as long as we're solving the Riemann problems anyway and using this wave propagation form for the first order update. It's a relatively small uh, increase in work to apply limiters to the alphas that came out in solving the Riemann problems and then add in these second order correction terms. And by applying the limiters to the wave separately, uh, we're also able to take, in, or take advantage of the fact that we know what direction each wave is going. So the upwind direction will be different for different waves. So in acoustics, for example, you have a right going wave and a left going wave, and you want to limit the right going wave based on looking at uh, one neighboring family of, of waves, whereas for the left going wave, you want to look in the other direction. And you don't want to do it component-wise, you don't want to limit p and u separately in the acoustics equations because they're all really kind of mixed together. And it's really the characteristic variables that are split things up into, into the waves that are simply advecting with constant shape in different directions. So this gives a very natural sort of generalization of these scalar algorithms to systems of equations. But going back to the scalar problem, um, so again, the top line is just, again, reminder of what this method looks like when we replace delta Q by this delta N. Um, so how do we do that limiting? Um, well, the idea we're going to look at is to introduce this theta I minus a half N, which is a ratio of the jump that we're trying to limit, which is in the denominator here, Q I minus Q I minus one, the ratio of that to the neighboring jump Q capital I minus Q capital I minus one, where capital I is uh, one cell to the left or the right, depending on what the upwind direction is. So we look at the slope in the, across the interface that we're working on. And again, this is a flux limiter method. So we're working on a particular interface, I minus a half. We're looking at the jump um, across that interface, but then we're looking at the interface to the left or to the right, depending on what the upwind direction is. And we're going to limit the value in our, the jump across uh, the wave at the interface we're working on based on how big the jump is in the neighboring interface in the upwind direction. So that's kind of an, a generalization of the slope limiter idea. And notice that this theta, this sort of smoothness indicator, um, if the solution is behaving smoothly, then we expect the jump to not vary much from one interface to the next. So we would expect in that case that this, this ratio is going to be close to 1. Might be like 1 plus order delta x if, if things are varying smoothly. Um, also, if we're near an extreme point, if we've got data that has a maximum somewhere, then we've got a slope in one direction that's negative and a slope in the other direction that's positive. Similarly, the, the jump at one interface would be positive and the jump at the neighboring interface negative. Um, and so 
when whenever this ratio is negative, then that means the slopes have different signs. So we know that where things are smooth, we want to be using a second order method where uh, there's a jump in slope or where the slope changes sign, we probably have to use zero slope in order to make sure we don't introduce any new extrema. And for these TVD methods, we'll typically have to set, set the limiter to zero when theta is negative. So based on those criteria, we can kind of define a, a limiter function phi of theta. Um, and then once we've defined some phi of theta, and this is where the different limiters will define different phi of thetas, but once we've defined that, we apply that phi function to this particular jump at the interface we're looking at and multiply the original jump by that limited version. And that gives us our delta that actually goes into the method up here. And based on what we were just looking at, a couple of desirable properties. If theta is less than or equal to zero, then we're at a, a maximum or a minimum, and we should set phi equal to zero. If we set phi to zero, then this, this little delta is zero, which means that the method up here at the top just reduces to the upwind method. Um, so we're not adding in any of the second order corrections in, in that case. Um, on the other hand, when when theta is near one, we want phi to be roughly equal to one so that the delta is actually just equal to the capital delta Q. And then this becomes the lax wendroff method. And in fact, if you set phi of theta just to be identically zero for all theta, then uh, all of these second order corrections would drop out and we'd just be reduced to the upwind method. Um, or if we set phi of theta equal to one for all theta, then it's just the lax wendroff method. Um, but if we choose uh, other options, we get different methods. So in particular, if we choose phi of theta equal to theta, then um, if we replace phi here by theta, which is Q capital I minus Q capital I minus one or QI minus QI minus one. When we multiply that by the jump in Q, the denominator cancels that. And what we're left with is that the correction we're using is Q capital I minus Q capital I minus one. So rather than using the jump QI, QI minus QI minus one, we're using the jump from the upwind uh, interface. So for it, the interface between i minus one and i, we look at one to the left of that and use the jump from there. And that ends up giving the beam warming method. And now the stencil uses two points to the left and only the cell that we're in. Um, on the other hand, if we set um, phi to be the average of one and theta, then we're sort of averaging lax wendroff and beam warming. It turns out that just gives you the, the centered slope when you add those two together, the, the center value of Q drops out and you're getting the average uh, centered difference of, of Q values in the cell and one, uh, two cells back. So that's Fromm's method. And if we set phi of theta just to be the min mod of one in theta, so whichever is smaller in magnitude, one or theta or zero if they have, if theta is negative, so it has a different sign than one, then it turns out this reduces to exactly the min mod method. So the methods we've looked at so far can all be put into this flux limiter framework. Yeah, so here again, um, here I've written it out just for the case where u is positive, because I wanna now look at how could we prove that a method like this is TVD. So rather than trying to use this reconstruct evolve average approach. We're just going to look at it algebraically and see if we can derive conditions that have to be satisfied in order for such a method to be TBD. And you can go through something similar for u less than zero, um, but I'll just go through the u greater than zero case. And also I'll use nu to represent the current number because that comes up all over the place. It makes it a little cleaner if we call nu u times delta t over, oh, that should be delta x in the denominator. So this is our flux differencing method um, with this flux here. And then with the framework that we were just looking at, we 
this little delta is really phi evaluated at the smoothness indicator of theta times the jump in Q. And we can write this when we, this is the flux at I minus a half here. We also have a similar formulation for the flux at I plus a half, which would have everything, all the I's shifted up by one. Um, when you plug those into the flux differencing framework, you can rewrite it in the form here, where I've taken the um, phi at theta I minus a half times the jump in Q is what comes in naturally to this flux. The one at the boundary to the right, that the I plus a half should really be Q I plus one minus QI, it should involve QI plus one minus QI, but notice that QI plus one minus QI, you can write as one over theta I plus a half times QI minus QI minus one. And so if you do that, then you can replace this term by something that's still proportional to this QI minus QI minus one, but it brings in this one over theta here. And then we have, of course, the phi function evaluated at theta I plus a half from the the right side of the cell. So this is really just the flux differencing, but I've rewritten it in kind of a weird way so that it ends up looking like um, we're just updating the cell average QIN by some constant times the jump uh, between QI and QI minus one. So that's a strange way to write it because this coefficient here also involves QI plus one, um, but it's this form that's going to allow us to prove that this method is TVD or derive conditions under which this method is TVD. And I've written it in terms of QI minus QI minus one, because I was, again, assuming U is positive. If you want to do this for U negative, then you do something similar, but you write it in terms of QI plus one minus QI, so that it looks like it's sort of upwinded in the other direction. So in the book, um, there's a theorem 6.1, which is due to Ami Harden, that is used to, to prove that this is TVD. Um, I'm only going to use part of that theorem here um, because I'm only looking at the case u greater than zero. And so part of the theorem says that if you have a method of this form, which we were just looking at, it's the cell average is updated by some coefficient ci minus one times the jump in q looking to the left, then you can prove that it's TVD provided that all of these C I N coefficients are between zero and one for all values of I. Um, and they can otherwise be allowed to depend any way you want on the, the data, all of the QNs potentially, or several neighboring values and delta X and delta T. Um, but the important point is that they're all between zero and one. The more general statement of this theorem also involves a, a d sub i n times qi plus one minus qi, and that part is needed if we're looking at um, u negative. But for this part of the theorem, at least, um, this is all we need. And the more general statement has some relations between the c's and d's, but for looking at one side or the other, we really only need part of the theorem. Okay, so. Um, this is the theorem that as long as these C's are between zero and one for all I, then this method will be TVD. So let's look at the proof of this theorem first, because it's a little bit interesting how you, how you go about proving this and there's a, a little trick involved. Um, so again, this is the form of the method that we're thinking about here. And just a reminder, the total variation of Q is just the sum over all the grid cells, and we're looking only at the Cauchy problem here. So I goes off to plus and minus infinity, and we're assuming that the function approaches constant states at plus and minus infinity. So this total variation is, is bounded at every time step. Um, oh, and also I'm leaving off the subscript, superscript n. So all the Qs without superscripts are at time n, just to simplify the notation a bit. Um, so only if it's at the new time, n plus one, am I putting the superscripts in here? And so what we want to show is that this method up here at the top is TVD provided that this condition is satisfied on all the coefficients. And so if we just take this formula here and we difference it, if we take QI plus one, n plus one, which is the same formula, but with I replaced by I plus one and subtract off QI, n plus one, 
then we get this formula, which we can rearrange a little bit this way. And so if we want to sum up the absolute values of all of these jumps, then we can um, use the triangle inequality. We can take the absolute value of this whole quantity, but that's less than or equal to the absolute value of the first part plus the absolute value of the second part by the triangle inequality. But then if we have this condition satisfied, then 1 minus ci and ci minus 1 are both between 0 and 1, so they're both uh, non-negative in particular, so we can pull them outside of the absolute value signs. And so we finally get this expression at the bottom here for the, the sum of the jumps. And so to compute the total variation, we just want to sum those up over all i. And so we have this inequality. Um, and now at this point, you might be tempted to say, well, um, all of the c's are less than or equal to 1. So we could just um, drop them out or replace them by 1s. And this would still be true. And similarly, 1 minus ci is always less than or equal to 1. So we can just ignore those terms, ignore those terms. Um, but then what you get is something that's bounded by the total variation of q at time n plus also the total variation of q at time n. And so you get a bound that's the total variation at the next time step is no greater than twice the total variation at the previous time step. And that wouldn't be any good because every time step it could be doubling and you'd have exponential growth of the total variation potentially. So that's not good enough. Um, so here's where the trick comes in. Um, the second sum that we have here is a sum over it's a sum over all i. It's written as c i minus 1 times q i minus q i minus 1. But since it's a sum over all i, we could replace i by i plus 1 in the sum. And if we do that, then the second sum here becomes just the sum of c i times absolute q i plus 1 minus q i. So this sum is equivalent to what we had up here. But now if you look at it, this sum and this sum both involve um, absolute value of qi plus 1 minus qi. And the coefficients are 1 minus ci and plus ci. So we can combine those into a single sum. And we have 1 minus ci plus ci, or just 1 times absolute qi plus 1 minus qi. And that finally gives us the total variation. So you need to do this little trick of shifting the indices, convince yourself that that little bit of magic actually works, and that we then have a proof that this method is total variation diminishing. OK, so in summary, this method with these funny coefficients here uh, is of that form. Of, and it's TVD provided that all of these coefficients are between 0 and 1. And here I've, well, this depends on theta i plus a half in here and theta i minus a half in here. In principle, those could be unrelated to each other. One's looking at the jump across uh, one pair of interfaces, another at a, jumps across a different pair of interfaces. So down below, I've written in terms of theta 1 and theta 2. And this should be true for all values of theta 1 and theta 2. Um, so what we'd like to show is that under some conditions, this inequality holds for all theta 1 and theta 2. And well, um, we would expect to also require that the Krant number nu, remember nu is, is our u delta t over delta x, we should expect that the Krant number has to be between 0 and 1 for this method since we're looking at um, the case where u is positive. So, but Looking at all nu in that range, we'd like to have this condition satisfied for all theta 1 and theta 2. And if you think about that a bit and sort of maximize over this range of nu's, it turns out that um, it suffices to show that this um, phi of theta 1 over theta 1 minus phi of theta 2 is always between uh, minus 2 and 2. If that's true and you plug that in here, then you can show that for this range of news that we have the required inequality. And if you think about this uh, inequality down at the bottom here, um, again, since theta 1 and theta 2 are completely independent, uh, we, can re we can force this difference to be between plus and minus 2 if we require each of these independently to be between 0 and 2. So 
what we want is this, that all the, the difference phi of theta 1 over theta 1 minus phi of theta 2 should be between minus 2 and, and 2. Um, for all values of theta 1 and theta 2, that can be reduced to this condition, that we need both phi of theta over theta to be between 0 and 2, and also phi of theta to be between 0 and 2. So then both of these are between 0 and 2, and then the difference between them has to be between plus and minus 2. Or another way to write these two inequalities at the bottom is that phi of theta has to lie between 0 and min mod of 2 and 2 theta. If you think about it from this inequality multiplying by theta, you get phi of theta is less than or equal to 2 theta. Here you have phi of theta is less than or equal to 2, and you need it also to be positive. And so that's a concise way to summarize that condition. Um, so if we plot the function phi of theta as a function of theta, then the values have to lie in this shaded region. This uh, upper limit here is 2 theta, and the top limit is 2, and we have to be greater than 0. Over here, where things are negative, it really has to be equal to 0, but to the right it can be anywhere in this shaded region. So we can define a limiter function that's zero here, and then it can behave however you want in here, and it would give you a TBD method. So if we look at some of the standard methods, the standard second order methods, they don't stay inside this region. So lax wendroff for example, the red line is just phi equals one for all theta. B morming is phi equals theta for all theta. From is the average. 1 plus theta over 2. Um, all of them go outside of this TBD region, and as we know, none of them um, do a good job at suppressing oscillations. None of them are TBD methods. Um, but one thing you notice about all of these methods is that they go through phi of 1 equals 1, this condition here. Um, and that's because, remember, when theta is equal to 1, that means the solution is smooth. That means qi minus qi minus 1 is is almost equal to Q capital I minus Q capital I minus 1, looking in the upwind direction. And so when things are smooth, um, theta is near 1, and all of any second order method should um, have phi of 1 equal to 1. Um, so this is called a Sweeby diagram sometimes. Peter Sweeby wrote a paper on on limiter methods uh, back when these methods were first being developed where you first kind of looked at things this way. And he also examined a bunch of limiters. And one thing he found was that um, although any limiter function that lies in this gray region will give you a TBD method, the ones that seemed to work best were actually sort of a somewhere between beam warming and lax wendroff. So there they were um, of course, they had to be zero over here, but then over here they were they had values which lay in this shaded region here, and um, for theta greater than one, between beam warming and lax wendroff and still being TBD would mean that they the values sort of lie in this region, um, and of course anything that lies in that shaded region has to pass through this point phi of one equals one, which is a condition that you want for for second order accuracy, you're close to it on, on smooth solutions. So that's a natural condition. Um, but also, uh, if you deviate from this region, things did not seem to work as well as in this region. So all of the other limiters we'll look at sort of lie within that shaded region. So here's that shaded region again. Um, and the min mod method, which we've already looked at, it turns out is simply the lower limit of that shaded region. Um, in mod of 1 and theta follows the lower bound, that red curve. Um, but as we've seen, min mod um, doesn't really sharpen things up as much as you might like. And you can think of this as being sort of the minimal amount of, of limiting that gives you a TDD method that lies in this uh, sweepy region. Um, so you might want to go a little higher than that. And so another natural choice might be, rather than looking at the lower bound of this region, let's look at the upper bound, which would be kind of as much sharpening as, as possible in staying in this region. Um, and then oops. if you look at the upper bound, 
Um, well, that gives you exactly what I've called the super B limiter. Um, and the formula for it is down here at the bottom, but it's uh, graphically, it's just the upper bound of this sweeby region. Uh, but it turns out when you do experiments with super B, it's kind of, uh, it does a good job of keeping discontinuity sharp, but it also tends to sharpen up smooth things and something that starts out as a sort of highly oscillatory sine wave will kind of turn into a square wave after a little while. Uh, so it's a bit too much limiting. Um, also, if you look here at the point um, theta equals one, it's true that phi of, of one equals one, but there's also a kink in this limiter, which means you sort of have discontinuous behavior depending on whether you're a little above or a little below. And it turns out for even better accuracy on smooth solutions, it's nice if you have a smooth function going through this point rather than a kink. Minmod, which followed the lower boundary, also has a kink at that point. Um, so um, the MC limiter is one that is smoother there and also doesn't go quite as high uh, around this point as, as super B does. Um, and you can think of this as the curve. Um, the curve here is basically the curve from Fromm's method. Fromm's method was a phi of theta is a half um, one plus theta. So that's this line here, but it's cut off by this sweeby region and then follows the upper bound to the right and um, comes down and of course is identically zero when theta is less than zero. So that turns out to be a pretty good limiter for, for many cases. There's another somewhat similar limiter that's even smoother um, called the Van Leer limiter. Uh, Brown Van Leer introduced this one. I think he also introduced the MC limiter in one of his papers in the early days of these methods. Um, but this one behaves quite similarly to MC. It doesn't sharpen things up quite as much um, when theta is large. And so I think the MC works a little better, but, but they both work pretty well. Okay, and here's just a summary again of the methods that we've looked at. And um, we've gone through sort of how you can show that all of these methods down below the high resolution limiters are all TVD according to uh, that theorem that we proved.